basically once again. All right, so we are, we are looking at today the last learning outcome, which is primarily going to be focused on, you know, understanding um, bits and pieces around, you know, how do we work and communicate with stakeholders when you're working within multidisciplinary teams. So we've had a bit of a journey in terms of coverage for the unit, which basically includes, you know, understanding what are multidisciplinary teams, why they are required, why, what kind of people work within these teams, they bring, what kind of skills they bring, experience, and specifically in the context of health and social care sector, we looked at, <clears throat> you know, why is it important to work within MDTs and why this sector cannot do without, uh, you know, the formation of MDTs in any case. Um, in the second one, we went on to understand, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses and obviously how do, how do leaders, managers, people in the supervisory position actually bring across and put together a multidisciplinary team which has a common understanding on goal. Uh, you know, they are motivated and they understand that this is the larger goal that they have to achieve than looking at working individually. And then how do teams perform? So in this case, we looked at, you know, formation of team using the Tuckman's model, if you recall, Tuckman's team building model. And we also looked at Dr. Belbin's, uh, you know, team roles model in terms of when teams are put together, how people look at taking up different roles and the three different categories of roles. Uh, which Dr. Belvin has, you know, categorized across the nine types which can be seen when teams are formed. So obviously, in the health and social care sector, we can get to see multidisciplinary teams and or most individual taking up at least one or assuming one type of role when they when they work within large groups or teams to be able to deliver a uh, deliver basically integrated care in this case. The third learning outcome was focused on understanding barriers. What could be barriers in general? What are obstacles, challenges, barriers which, which we face? And, you know, when we look at these barriers, what kind of barriers can uh, crop up when we work within large teams? What could be the impact of these barriers? And then last but not the least, how do we overcome some of these barriers, which, was, which is where we looked at things like, you know, communication, team meetings, looking at centralized decision-making, consensus building, and obviously effective leadership, which helps us overcome some of these barriers or obstacles which come across when people with lots of skills, lots of uh, years of experience and background, different cultural background, uh, come across and work together in a team. Now, in the last learning outcome, we are focused on how do we look at communicating with various stakeholders when you're working as a member or as a part of a multidisciplinary team. So there is a quite a bit to look at in terms of the indicative content here. So first we'll understand what are the practical issues of working uh, within a multiple, multidisciplinary team. So these issues are going to be based around communication, you know, time management, things like that, which could, uh, you know, which, which are basically issues that we generally get to see when we work uh, in groups and teams. We will also look at, in the second part, what is effective communication? So it's a very big word, a very generic term, but we will look at specifically from a contextualized purpose of health and social care sector that when we talk about effective communication, what does that stand for in a multidisciplinary team? And what are the ways through which we can do effective communication? That means communication which is transparent, clear, crisp, uh, easily understood without jargons. And those are the bits that we will understand uh, you know, in this part. And then we will look at uh, equal opportunities. So here, some part of it is to dip into understand, understanding, you know, what do we mean by equal opportunities? What do we understand uh, by equalities and diversity? And in some cases, what we also want to do is understand some of the common issues which can come across and how organizations actually implement an equality and diversity policy or an equal opportunity policy to do away with discrimination and, you know, uh, meet and work with compliance in terms of legislation, the Equalities and Diversities Act of 2010, uh, and see and develop the code of practice, which can then be followed across the organization so that nobody feels discriminated and obviously nobody feels that they have been sidelined or, you know, uh, their motivation levels are low because in this sector, you generally need to have people who are motivated, enthusiastic, patient, uh, per they persevere, and they are also sympathetic to, uh, you know, working and understanding patient and patient, uh, you know, situations. And towards the end, we will look at understanding what is stakeholder management. And obviously, one of the assessment criteria 4.0 talks about 
how do we engage with stakeholders in multidisciplinary teams? So we'll understand who are the stakeholders first when an MDT is formed, and then how do we go about communicating with these stakeholders? So yesterday we discussed very briefly in terms of you know, who are the stakeholders in MDT? So, or in an organization in general, it could be employees, management, directors, board, it could be the government, uh, it could be partners and suppliers or external bodies that you work with, compliance bodies, inspection bodies. And in some cases, you know, if you look at the financial side of it, it could be banks wherein, you know, some organizations get overdraft facility and things like that. So they all become stakeholders in the working and running and day-to-day -day operations of the organization in one way or the other. So we will understand stakeholder mat matrix here, who are the stakeholders within within multidisciplinary teams and how do we look at communicating with them in particular, if you are a member of the team and how do you write to somebody in the board, how do you, uh, you know, send across information with a, or share information with a parent, a family member of a parent and things like that. Now, in order to get into a bit of discussion uh, and understanding of this particular learning outcome, first, we should look at some of the key bits which are going to come across, uh, you know, with, with regards and reference to this unit. One of the key things that we will look at in this would be um, time and again across different assessment criteria would be that we will be looking at communication issues. So what are communication issues? How you communicate effectively? Why do we need to promote equal opportunities uh, while providing service service delivery, which is integrated care? And how do you engage with stakeholders uh, in terms of communication? So communication is a common word across all the four assessment criteria, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4. So it is important for me just to put this into a bit of context at the start of our discussion to say that Communication is going to be the key when we look at, uh, you know, essentially, um, you know, dealing with multidisciplinary teams and stakeholders. So if we literally look at just as a definition of, you know, dictionary definition of communication, it is basically exchanging or imparting information. So to a certain extent, when we talk about, you know, communication as a process, we have, uh, you know, three elements in it. I don't know whether you recall or not, but communication tends to be a three oblique five step uh, you know process so when we talk about communication there is somebody who is going to be sending information there is somebody who is going to be receiving information and then when we talk about in the middle you'll have something which is being used to process information that means you're sending an email so the in, a conduit in between the sender and the receiver is primarily technology maybe an email client or a pc and in some cases where we look at the, uh, you know, the receiver actually giving feedback or responding back to you, then in that case, you would see that feedback would become, uh, you know, the fourth part uh, in the communication process. So when we look at communication in general uh, as a process, if I just bring this across, uh, you know, here, uh, just for the context of understanding, if we look at communication as a process, uh, you know, it is a process in which the source which is the sender is actually sending the message. And if you break it down further, it could be things like, you know, the message being encoded if you're using a telephone or if you're using a technological equipment like an email or, or a PC to send an email. So again, some part of the software is actually doing the encoding. The message is getting transmitted over the internet uh, and the channel is that internet channel. Then it gets decoded in the user's machine or on the user's end when you receive a phone call and then that message is received by the receiver. And when the receiver actually gives you feedback or talks back and gives you response, that process would be considered as feedback and that looping of the person receiving the message and then giving feedback to the sender would essentially communicate uh, and complete the communication process. Now, what could be the issues that we face in this process is what we would be focused on when we discuss all the four ACs of this learning outcome. So things like cultural differences, which we covered yesterday, attitude in terms of conversation, that I'm a bit superior, I have more experience. It could be general, you know, attitude difference, attitudinal differences, which people could have. It could be sometimes when you are in a, in a meeting and, you know, obviously you're not very uh, connected with what is being discussed, you might show signs of lack of motivation or engagement while being in that meeting. Listening skills are important. 
communication in terms of how you write when we briefly mentioned written communication spoken communication and within that you have formal informal communication and then looking at appropriate tools if i'm looking at presenting today and if i just look at a verbatim without showing you any slide that not might not be an appropriate way of communicating and discussing the lo so in this case my appropriate communication tool is using you know a, a powerpoint presentation to visually show you uh, some bits of what i'm going to discuss and that will engage the user in this case the learner at the other end uh, uh, to par be participative in the process of that discussion and delivery of this presentation and sometimes we also can have issues if we have an information overload sometimes we use this word wherein when we talk about information overload and what we mean by that is you're sending too much information uh, across, you know, it could be um, essentially, you know, sharing of data, sharing of uh, information, which is much more than what is required. And that would uh, basically impact the decision making process or maybe impact the understanding of, uh, you know, a particular issue by the other person. So in this case, we also can say, uh, you know, uh, oversharing can also be, or if we have, if we use a particular terminology, and that terminology could be jargons, for example, that I, if I keep using MDTs, MDTs, and I don't explain the meaning or the full form of the term MDTs, then that would create a bit of a, you know, issue in terms of not understanding that what does MDT stand for. So, multidisciplinary teams or MDT, I need to make sure that I kind of specify that and that tends to be uh, you know, resolving or hopefully does not lend, end up creating any communication issues. Now, outside this, there could be broader, lots of different types of broader communication issues. But the idea here is to try and just put them into a perspective that when we talk about uh, how do the learning outcome says understand how to communicate with team members from disciplines and with stakeholders so in general what we need to do is pick out some of these practical issues that we see are going to be things uh, which which cause problems issues or you know um, let's say uh, friction in terms of uh, working together within a team and these tend to be some of the uh, practical issues that i can you know look at summarizing now we look at them in a bit more detail. Um, so that leads us nicely into the first uh, assessment criteria. And they are, uh, the first one talks about analyzing practical communication issues related to MDT or multidisciplinary teams uh, working. So here, some of the bits that we discussed earlier, we need to now drill them into a bit more detail and contextualize them specifically for health and social care sector. We are not going to be, dis we are not discussing communication issues in general. We are looking at discussing communication issues which can crop up when people work in multidisciplinary teams. That means doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, healthcare workers, assistants, or, you know, practice managers, all of them come from different backgrounds. Uh, they have different roles and responsibilities. And when they work together, what kind of practical issues can come across because of uh, lack of communication or incomplete communication or, uh, you know, informal or, uh, um, let's say, um, and, uh, you know, different types of communication, but uh, that would mean that it is not being, you know, everybody is not singing from the same, you know, songbook. So there was a survey done by CQC, and in the survey which was done, this is something which I'm quoting from the CQC website. In this survey, you know, what they did was, they surveyed a lot of patients um, uh, within a particular setup uh, and what the conclusion of that survey was that patients naturally feel a bit apprehensive about their health and well-being uh, because they feel that there are numerous issues or barriers which basically or let's say obstacles which create get created when communication isn't very clear or is not consistent in terms of providing information to patients receiving care uh, in a setup like a hospital or a care home. And some of these practical issues, which from a patient perspective were highlighted in the survey, include things like time constraints. So when nurses, we'll go into a lot of detail in this, but just very briefly say, for example, if a doctor goes out on a round or a nurse goes out on a round, there are lots of time constraints with them because they are looking after too many patients. 
And in this case, what tends to happen is that they spend only a few minutes or maybe only a few uh, you know, uh, minutes to basically discuss or provide information to the patient. They do not give the patient an opportunity to ask questions. There could be environmental issues if the place is noisy or there is lack of privacy. There could be things like pain and fatigue, which was specifically in the case of patients. It could be embarrassment and anxiety, again, related specifically to patients. Use of jargons, which is by the health and social care staff or the medical staff or the multidisciplinary teams which work in order to provide patient care. There was uh, bits and pieces on values and belief, information overload, there were data prediction issues, and obviously record keeping, which is different in different organizations. Now, these are some of the practical issues which are faced uh, because of differences in communication uh, in, in multidisciplinary teams. And then what I've done in the subsequent slide is I've gone into a bit more detail in terms of why these issues crop up. So when we talk about, say, multidisciplinary teams, it is very important for us to understand that some of these uh, members which work within these teams, healthcare workers, you know, doctors, nurses, consultants, they have varying responsibility and their uh, you know, skill set and is, is also different, is varying because some of them have years of experience and some of them have, uh, you know, are in, still in the process of developing experience. So in some cases, what tends to happen is that when we look at uh, the information which is shared where, you know, and the level of information which is shared, this can cause, you know, miscommunication, confusion, misunderstanding, and can actually diminish the ability of providing integrated care to be able to achieve goals. So it is very important to deal with these practical issues in communication because, and that is where you see structures or operationalized structures being formed within the within these teams to be able to deliver effective care. So when you look at hospitals, for example, uh, and you look at a typical hospital and you look at a structure of the hospital, there are different teams which are working in different uh, setups. So there is a front-end team, there is a clinical team, there's a non-clinical team, there is a nursing team or, or a triage, which is a combination of nurses, healthcare workers, uh, which basically, and a clinical nurse, which basically provide, uh, you know, post uh, operative care to patients who undergone surgery. And these teams then work in uh, individual silos, yet looking at delivering integrated care to the patient because of the fact that dividing the large teams into smaller teams also does away with, uh, you know, confusion but it also creates clear lines of communication and uh, helps avoid some of the practical issues which can happen because of information overload or too much information being passed on to teams which find which may find it irrelevant for their purposes of delivering their duties now if we look at some of the issues that we discuss here time constraint environmental issues all these issues that we discuss and when we put that into context of multidisciplinary teams we are looking at some of the issues which can arise and relate to communication can, can, can happen because of collaboration issues. That means teams are not working effectively together. There are issues in terms of working together, sharing information, and sometimes you know it's a case of attitudes and people from different setups and backgrounds coming together to be able to work in a team, and there they lack collaboration which can create, uh, uh, you know, which, which obviously can create issues. Now, the reasons for lack of collaboration could be down to communication issues from the leadership, communication issues in terms of clearly defining roles and responsibilities. And that is why this point makes uh, perfect sense when we deal with multidisciplinary teams, people coming with different backgrounds, skills, experience, and, you know, roles and responsibilities the only way that you can wrap around and help them co collaborate effectively to achieve a team goal can be done by proper channels, by setting up proper channels of communication. Then we also look at uh, a point which is challenges. And when we look at challenges in particular, we look at challenges is because you would generally see that when people are faced with challenges, one of the key things or obstacles, issues when they come up, when people work within teams, they need to resort to communicating effectively. That means they need to be able to 
clearly tell what are the challenges being faced. So challenges, things like pain and fatigue, we look at stress, we look at, for example, distractions, or we look at environment uh, in terms of, you know, work environment is too noisy or there are time constraints in terms of, uh, you know, dealing with so many patients. These are challenges which, you know, uh, say, for example, nurses, doctors, consultants can face within the team and how they can be communicated in order to avoid uh, and address them effectively. They can be done by, again, proper channels of, uh, you know, communication. Then we look at, um, you know, sharing of useful skills. Now, the reason why we look at uh, useful skills, um, and I would bring this across is that when people work in teams and groups, they bring across, uh, they come from different backgrounds, they bring across different experiences, they bring across different, they have obviously different skills. And in order to make them work in unison, that means in order for them to work effectively as a team, as a coherent team, to be able to deliver services, uh, you know, managers or uh, supervisors or leaders of those teams have to then look at putting together uh, workshops or trainings essentially for them to be able to make them work together. So it's like saying, if I bring together nurses, healthcare assistants, consultants and doctors into one team to be able to deliver, say, for example, a certain uh, type of care within a, within a setup like a care home, what we need to do is we need to be all singing from the same songbook. That means we need to know exactly the same uh, and uh, use the same policies and procedures. We need to be able to understand how things work within, uh, within the organization. And then we also need to understand our roles and responsibilities and who do we depend on or go to if there is a problem issue or an obstacle which comes up. So people uh, which deal with patients on a day-to-day -day basis, if they face problems, the next first line of support is this, the second line of support is this, and then who the problem needs to be escalated if this is not uh, being solved. So this fine tuning of how team members work within uh, teams and are able to effectively work can only be done by looking at understanding the skill set of the members of the team and also then looking at doing trainings or team building exercises or some sort of activities which will enable effective communication amongst them and this will basically mean that the members of the team can depend on each other can communicate with them uh, communicate with each other freely and they know exactly who to uh, go on and look on to if they learn, if they face an issue or if they face a problem so some of these points that we look at are areas in which practical, uh, you know, let's say communication problems uh, or issues are faced. And these can then be solved by looking at doing team building exercises, helping to develop a team working culture. And here in the, the you know, in these team building exercises and some of the workshops and trainings which are conducted the idea there is the managers or the supervisors or the management in general is trying to create a, an atmosphere wherein there is an acceptable uh, standard of working amongst, you know, the members of various members of the team. And this would mean that they have mutual respect. They, um, you know, all are able to contribute, um, you know, in terms of voicing their opinions. There is a, a structure in a team to be able to resolve problems. And <clears throat> there is absence of personal agendas. There is nobody driving any personal agenda within these teams. And that is where policies and procedures come into place because if they are communicated effectively and everybody understands the meaning of these policies, uh, say for example, equality and diversity, discrimination, look at safeguarding, some of these policies which are put into practice while, while teams work together and they provide services to patients within a particular setup, you would see that this can only come across if there are clear lines of uh, you know communication which are set and clear channels which are available for the staff to be able to communicate with uh, you know each other now if we also look at some of the other um, some of the main uh, you know issues which were listed down on slide one when we talk about time constraints what do we mean by time constraint and uh, obviously i gave a small example is that when doctors go around, go for a round or nurses go for a round, if they have too many patients 
allocated uh, for them to be able to look into then the time they allocate uh, you know tends to be uh, on a basis of uh, how many patients they need to see and sometimes this can be a constraint because the patients are not able to ask questions or to resolve their queries and that would mean that it tends to be a one way uh, you know channel wherein the doctors nurses or you know the professionals going around for the rounds in a setup is only able to do uh, or spend time so much time with the patients which means there are time constraints so in some cases if there are patients within the same bay and if there is no way that you can actually, uh, you know, uh, say, for example, segregate or separate uh, the background noise, which could be if it's a busy clinic or if it's a busy place like a &E's tend to be, there are communication difficulties which can happen because of uh, lots of noise in the background. And in some cases, um, you know, equipment and also other things contributing to background noise and also distractions. And this can impede communication, specifically when we talk about, uh, you know, health, healthcare professionals or a multidisciplinary team or somebody from the team dealing with the patient. Pain and fatigue, again, this could be sometimes patients are too stressed um, and, you know, th there has to be an appropriate and a right time for communication in terms of understanding, uh, you know, when we ask generally the questions, what's the best time to have a discussion with you or can you wait uh, to have this discussion with the consultant? And sometimes we also look at, uh, you know, giving some part of this information in a written format. Um, and a, a good example that I would give you here would be that if there are patients who are undergoing some sort of an operation, uh, you know, in the near future, things like cardiac operations or, you know, cancer operations and things like that. Normally, there is a but there is a team of individuals which will be dealing with the patient and that I would classify as a multidisciplinary team. You'll have a nurse, you'll have, uh, you know, a, a, a say, for example, somebody who would be looking after, uh, you know, uh, you basically when the patient is to go undergo a surgery, there will be two or three different types of teams. There'll be team which will prepare the patient. So there are consultations which happen with the nurse, with the consultant, with the doctor, and you are you are given adequate information even before you undertake the procedure. So you will be maybe getting leaflets, some information about how the procedure will go through, how long will it last for you to you know get better, what kind of care would be provided after the operation. So these are things which are discussed even before the uh, you know operative uh, you know procedure takes place, and then. Once you decide that you are going to go through with it, there is a team which is put in place, which helps you recover. So it could be a physiotherapist, it could be a nurse, healthcare professional, you know, doctors with regular appointments to come in and visit you. And they would then be responsible to, uh, you know, get you back onto track in terms of after the surgery has happened. So in some cases you would see, you know, pain and fatigue uh, tends to be the case. And that is why some of these are not rushed through um, <clears throat> discussion on side effects of medicines and other bits are also done uh, in order to ensure that, uh, you know, um, there is no miscommunication with regards to uh, the side effects of any medication and things like that. Some of these points are self-explanatory. When you look at embarrassment and anxiety from a patient perspective, it could be related to sometimes when examination, physical examinations have to be done, some patient might have cultural beliefs. Uh, or, you know, um, um, they come from a background wherein, you know, some of these things might be new. And in those cases, if this is not discussed in detail, even before the, these, uh, you know, things have to happen, uh, it can be a cause of embarrassment and anxiety with some patients. So that is, again, here, what tends to happen is that patients and healthcare prof professionals tend to communicate uh, effectively. And if the communication is not done, then it can, uh, you know, lead to embarrassment and anxiety at the patient's end. And that would mean that, you know, the patient might not be very cooperative or uh, might dissuade, uh, you know, from taking, undertaking the procedure and things like that. <clears throat> then we, one of the key things that we look at, you know, in this particular sector is the use of jargons. So uh, one of the reasons why we face practical issues in communication within multidisciplinary teams is that sometimes people start to use terms or jargons which, uh, which might not, uh, you know, which could be technical in their uh, usage and might not mean anything to other members of the team or in some cases they might not understand 
the use of these words uh, in in communication. So again, sometimes you get to hear that. Can you can you get can you get tell me the diagnosis in very plain English, or can you tell me what is the outcome going to be in plain English? So in some cases, you would see that this could become a practical communication issue because if a consultant or a doctor or a nurse starts to use a lot of acronyms or jargons, which could be technical in their nature and not easy for the patients to understand or the team members to understand, this could become a, a practical issue. And then there are issues in terms of values, beliefs, and assumptions, which could be from a patient's point of view, uh, as I mentioned, information overload. And there's a good article that I would suggest that you should read uh, in order to understand some uh, you know, bits in terms of practical communication issues, which is going to be up on Moodle. And the article is, uh, uh, you know, a, a article basically, which is, you know, labeled as communication skill two, overcoming barriers to effective communication. And this is a good read uh, because of the fact that um, it allows, Sorry, so it allows uh, you know uh, you to understand in terms of what kind of practical issues come up, and this is something which has been compiled together, um, you know, by uh, a, a team within the NHS, um, and it's a good three. It, it's a good read, uh, about ten minutes uh, for the article, but it's a good read. Now, let's look at the second assessment criteria, which is to talk about how. Uh, you know, do we communicate effectively in a multidisciplinary team? In order to put this uh, perspective forward, I've got a small video, which I want you to watch, and then we'll do a bit of a small discussion on, on this uh, to explain in terms of, you know, wh why is effective communication important uh, within a multidisciplinary team? So let's listen into this particular video, which is, uh, I think, about three or two odd minutes and will give us a good perspective in terms of uh, why effective communication is important and how does it happen within a multidisciplinary team. The multidisciplinary model has clear added value in cancer care because treatment algorithms are not always sufficient and often do not yield absolute recommendations. Strategic decisions, especially at initial diagnosis when the treatment plan is defined, should always be taken after a multidisciplinary discussion. Communication and interpersonal relations are main challenges to effective collaboration in a multidisciplinary team. Diverse personalities, lack of trust, competition, passivity of some team members, as well as not having communication codes or behavioral standards are some of the issues we face. Overcoming these obstacles means facing individual and team challenges. As individuals, we must overcome prejudices, personal interest, and conflicts with colleagues. Every team member must refocus and remember the common objective and take responsibility for contributing their expertise. Empathy and genuine interest in others are fundamental ingredients. The entire team must strive for a common objective of identifying optimal solutions for patients. It is the team's responsibility to encourage the contribution of each member, identify useful experiences and expertise, and then follow the team's decision. Our Train the Trainer program offers participants the tools to identify the needs of a multidisciplinary team, improve its efficacy, and achieve active participation from each member. So this gives us an idea in terms of, you know, what we need to look at uh, when a lot of different organizations actually look at uh, you know, uh, developing effective communication channels uh, when dealing with or having multidisciplinary teams within a particular setup. So here, it is quite important for us to look at relating to why and how this effective communication can happen. So we've understood why communication is important and what are the practical issues. But what we need to do in this assessment criteria is to understand how can we communicate effectively when we are working as a part of an MDT or a multidisciplinary team? So here, some of the points that are important for us to understand is that 
when we talk about um, you know communicating effectively we need to be looking at certain policies and procedures so things like team policies which are important in terms of you know clear lines of roles and responsibilities being defined set of policies and procedures which are in place within an organization they could be termed as operational policies and these policies are then followed you know in order to do your day to day duties and they would then help in the effective communication amongst different members who are working within the multidisciplinary teams and these policies and protocols if i may put it this way can effectively help the organization achieve an optimum working setup specifically within the health and social care sector it is in general true for all organizations because the reason that we have these policies procedures quality policies and procedures as i would say and then we have their implementation plan is because these are issues problems obstacles that can be faced and have been faced time and again over over the years and because of which what the organization has done is developed a process or a policy which can be invoked should this problem again arise in the future now one of the second ways that we look at is when sometimes we have to communicate effectively there are a lot of managers or people within the you know uh, organization who have team leading responsibility they always try and build consensus when when they are looking at decision making uh, you know on important matters and this consensus building amongst the members of the team is also quite important because of the fact that when we see consensus being built uh, we see buy in happening from the members of the team and this allows you know everyone to focus on the central problem or the core issue and essentially helps the organization you know uh, meet that uh, you know obstacle or solve that problem so in this case a multidisciplinary team for example if it is providing care to and we looked at in the video if the team is if a team of professionals are providing care to a patient who is receiving cancer care then in those cases you know uh, the approach in which the care is to be provided whether uh, what what particular uh, you know line of uh, let's say um, uh, you know line of um, uh, say uh, you know procedures have to be followed Uh, or uh, what kind of remedy in terms of you know some sort of care or cure which has to be offered to the patient whether it's through medication whether it's through surgery whether it's through uh, you know um, post the surgery there is a plan which is put in place the consensus gets forms uh, you know it's important to have that consensus with the team so they know very clearly who's going when who's playing what part and how they are supporting the patient in order to uh, you know uh, during this trying period where the case patient is actually receiving cancer care we also look at um, you know when we talk about um, effective communication the role of leadership it is very important from a point of view of uh, looking at uh, making communication effective is that people in the leadership position are able to you know strike a chord with the team members in the sense that they are able to build a relationship they understand uh, and they are able to make uh, the team members understand that how the decision making process works um, you know what is their role and responsibility within the team what contributions they bring to the team and also in general the idea there is that they have a better uh, understanding or maybe because of their experience and the skills on the uh, let's say broader uh, roll out of clinical assessments and delivery uh, which is required to be given uh, when uh, when we talk about care being delivered to the patient so here the leaders have to take decisions or make decisions which are going to be best uh, in the case of providing care to an individual and the difference here between power and authority Uh, is the context which they try and make sure that the team and the members of the team understand and this allows them to uh, you know basically uh, bring about uh, harmony amongst the members of the team uh, in order to make sure that they are able to deliver integrated care to the patient so here in this case one of the things that i would put it this way the leader uh, you know if there is a new process say for example or a new um, let's say equipment being is being brought across into the uh, into the setup 
then one of the things which the managers or the leaders, people in the leadership position are responsible to do is to ensure that adequate training uh, is provided uh, so that members of staff who are going to be looking at working on that particular equipment or using that equipment uh, for patient care are confident, uh, you know, they are given that training and then they are confident in terms of using that equipment uh, in terms of providing the care required, uh, you know, for the for the patient. And this training uh, as a process, as an initiative from the leadership ensures that the staff is able to develop skills which is required to bring about uh, or, you know, to basically provide, uh, you know, this particular uh, care using or during the operations and the op operate, uh, let's say during the operating of this particular machine. So they need to have skills to be able to bring, uh, you know, um, this uh, working, you know, I would say this working um, to be able to give care uh, or say provide uh, diagnosis using the you know the equipment so this was a specific example which i've put uh, wherein leadership is required to take steps or initiatives in order to ensure that you know the um uh, in adequate training is provided uh, to relevant team members which will then allow them to be able to use that equipment effectively to provide care or you know for diagnosis the case in point here is if there is a new setup being introduced or a new wing being introduced in the hospital, sometimes you see expansion of setups happen and obviously a new wing is being introduced. Say, for example, a new department is being added for mental health care, providing services on mental health care. Uh, so adequate staffing in that department, training, providing, uh, providing of training to the staff members of the department which are going to join and you know provide these services to the patient equipment training on equipment which should be uh, used by the staff to be able to provide uh, or you know diagnose uh, you know certain conditions that requires uh, effective leadership and in this case this can be done provided leadership is able to <clears throat> ensure that uh, you know uh, the initiatives that they are going to be carrying out are essentially, uh, you know, helping to meet organizational goals. And this, these have to be communicated within to the members of the team in order to ensure they have their buy-in. One of the other points which I would put it this way, when we talk about how do we communicate effectively is also the organization looking at meeting, uh, you know, resources and logistics needs. So when I talk about, you know, meeting organizational resources and you know, logistics need. Now, sometimes if you are short of equipment or if you are short of resources uh, in terms of administrative resources, physical resources, infrastructure resources, then again, the process of communication comes into place wherein, you know, things like manuals, things like, um, I would say, um, use of stationery or, you know, basic bits which are, uh, if they are missing uh, or if they are, uh, uh, you know, running out, then again, in order to promote uh, and ensure that these things are made available in time and uh, before time, before it actually runs out, uh, you know, processes have to be put in place uh, so that the they can be reordered uh, at any, uh, you know, uh, adequately before time and they are available for the purposes of usage by, you know, various members working within the team and the staff. So again, sometimes availability of resources and logistics issues also can communicate, uh, also can relate, uh, you know, to uh, issues that can arise out of uh, not being able to communicate effectively. So things like if there is uh, like one of the things during the COVID pandemic is what we've seen is that a lot of hospitals and setups and PCC trust actually ran out of PPE equipment. One of the things which the government battled with um, and wanted to effectively communicate across to various setups, nursing home, care homes, old age homes, hospitals, uh, you know, GP surgeries, community centers uh, providing care was to ensure that effective utilization of PPE could happen uh, before the restocking was done. So when we look at Matt Hancock, at that point in time, the health secretary, uh, you know, then took a decision to order PPE worth 2.6 billion pounds, uh, which made sure that, uh, you know, members of staff working within, uh, you know, hospitals, care homes, uh, and various other setups 
were uh, not in line, you know, were actually being shielded by using proper PE and not being, uh, you know, not, not getting diagnosed with COVID, although some of these things did happen and then obviously comments stepped in. So again, effective communication uh, on the availability of resources and the logistics around the providing of PPE during the pandemic was one of the key things. And that is where, again, policies, procedures, leadership, uh, you know, consensus and, uh, you know, uh, working together as a team is required to basically deal with these practical issues. So any questions on uh, this so far? Okay. Now, the other bits that we want to look at in this uh, is the third assessment criteria, which is looking at explaining how do we promote equalities, equal opportunities in service delivery during, when people are working within multidisciplinary teams. So here, I think what we want to do is have a quick, broad understanding of what is equality and diversity, what is the compliance and legislation on equal opportunities. And that would basically cover up our bit in terms of uh, understanding uh, how how is this relevant to MDTs or multidisciplinary teams? So if I have to ask a question, what is equality and diversity? So equality, you know, if we look at is it basically means that everybody in your, uh, in a particular setting should have equal opportunities regardless of their ability, background or lifestyle or culture they come from. And because people within the NHS and health and social care sector, we have a lot of diversity and people come from different backgrounds. Here, what we need to be able to appreciate is that there are people with different, uh, different cultures, different beliefs, different values, and uh, we should be able to respect all of them when they come together to be able to offer their service to patients uh, and the community in general. Now, why is equal uh, opportunities important? It is important from a perspective that we as employers or within the NHS as an employer, they, there should not be any room for any discrimination and everybody working within the setup and within the uh, you know, national health service should be treated equally and fairly. And this is something which uh, you know, the NHS in particular um, you know, continues to ensure uh, that they are able to build a diverse workforce that can reflect the community uh, that, uh, that it serves. Now, when we talk about equalities and uh, you know equal opportunities in service delivery, uh, within service delivery in particular, it is important for us to understand you know what do we mean by equal opportunities. So, equal opportunities here would mean that you know when we deliver patient care to members of the public, what we are looking at is uh, there are no ways in which any form of discrimination tends to happen when this care is being uh, provided. So. Things like when we are looking at uh, equality, when we are looking at equal opportunities, what we are looking at is basically looking at how different community groups and voluntary organizations can work to deliver these services at the local level. How do we ensure that buildings, facilities and services are accessible to people with disabilities? So, for example, disabled wheelchair access which is important in job centers that we get to see, in hospitals that we get to see, parking slots being created, uh, you know, which are specifically marked for people with disabilities. And those are bits which mean that the setup or the organization is, you know, providing equal opportunities. So some of these things that we see, you know, uh, being reflected as uh, within uh, the printed collateral of NHS, for example, use of different faces, you know, uh, to show that the NHS caters to diverse range of people living within our community. Uh, you know, those are bits in which the, what we can see is that how equal opportunities are being promoted uh, when, uh, when, when NHS or national health service or, you know, uh, uh, mental health service or, you know, health and social care sector is basically providing delivery. And to put this into a bit of context, why do we look at equal opportunities? Because we have the Equality Act of 2010 in the UK, and this act replaces the anti-discrimination laws, which was a single act earlier. And this act basically says that, you know, we should be able to provide, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, basically provide duties uh, when, when we talk about, you know, uh, duties being provided from within the NHS and health and social care sector, irrespective of the disability, gender, race, uh, to the members of the public. And we should be able to do not, we should not discriminate between, uh, you know, any form of race, age, gender, identity, value or belief, 
or you know any form of uh, discrimination should be avoided so there are uh, ways in which we can promote equal opportunities and those are explained within some of these slides there are some good useful websites that i would say that you should look into for additional reading and these websites would primarily you know give you an idea in terms of how the national health service looks at providing equal opportunities when it you know provides services on uh, on patient care or mental health care to the members of public in general within the uk so this would help cover uh, you know the assessment criteria 4.3 the last one that we are looking at today is explain how do we engage with stakeholders in multidisciplinary teams. So when we look at stakeholders, let's identify who are stakeholders. Stakeholders are people who will have, you know, some sort of vested interest. So when we talk about stakeholders, um, you know, yesterday I explained the literal meaning of stakeholders is that people who have some sort of interest or concern in something, especially, for example, in day-to-day -day running or operations of the business. So they would be classed as stakeholders. Now, there are various types of stakeholders. These stakeholders could be, you know, users, providers, influencers, or government, uh, governance, essentially, UPIG, as we term them. Now, they can be of different types in different organizations. But in general, when we talk about the health and social care sector, stakeholders would be responsible. What, what, where will you find them? One is who they are. So they could be employers, it could be the government, banks, directors, owners, practice managers, you know, the management, uh, I would say suppliers or partners who work, uh, you know, with the NHS or uh, with the uh, various other agencies within the NHS, they would all be stakeholders because without them, the whole operation would uh, come to a standstill. Now, these stakeholders, what do they do? And what is their involvement in terms of, uh, you know, working within the setup? Their involvement is in terms of things like policy making. So when we look at inspection bodies, we look at agencies like CQC, uh, we, uh, we look at, uh, you know, government in terms of policy making, legislation, interaction legislation, like the NHS Act of 2010, um, you know, various other uh, legislations like Data Protection Act, Equality and Diversity Act, policy making by CQC, changes in terms of setting quality procedures, so their working as a stakeholder in this sector would be to look at policy making. That is one. Second, finances. If you look at government side, uh, the National Health Service is a public sector. It's financed by the government. Uh, and there are lots of people working within this sector. So they are classed as public sector workers. And in this case, when we look at finances, uh, you know, allocation of budge budgets, which happen to N uh, NHS, the various trusts within the NHS, GP surgeries, you know, community centers, things like that, which are providing some sort of care under the NHS banner, it will all require finances. Care planning, which has to be done, logistics side of things, and obviously evaluation of outcomes, which is done through, say, various agencies. So in these cases, what I would say is when we talk about stakeholders and their role, this is what we need to be able to understand very clearly that that, that is what we mean by stakeholders. Now, in this particular diagram, what I want to show is that there are various stakeholders within the health and social care sector, and they have a very close working relationship, which basically helps in, uh, you know, providing these services to the members of the public. So when we talk about stakeholders, we talk about uh, stakeholders from a point of view of the stakeholders matrix. And this is where you could basically, you know, look at you know, um, just as an example that, you know, how would, uh, uh, you know, various people within, uh, you know, the, say, for example, a setup uh, work when we look at this particular uh, example of, you know, uh, relationship between stakeholders. Now, in general, there is a theoretical model which we term as stakeholder analysis uh, or stakeholder matrix. And this particular, uh, you know, um, uh, let's say the tool is actually used to determine what kind of actions are necessary to be taken in order to make sure that the goals are achieved. So when we look at classification of our stakeholders and when we talk about, uh, you know, stakeholder analysis in general, when we do this, what we look at is um, um, this is a bit of a theoretical model that we need to look at is to try and understand that, you know, who are the key members uh, who are going to play uh, a what role within the setup in order to ensure that the organizational goals are achieved. 
So when we talk about this particular aspect of stakeholder analysis, what we tend to do is basically look at, um, you know, clearly specifying the roles and responsibilities of the individual members within the team and what uh, their contribution to the achievement of the overall objective is going to be. This is generally a project management tool which sometimes can be used uh, in order to look at, you know, classify, uh, in order to look at classification of stakeholders. And it can be used generically, you know, across all sectors. So it's not specific to health and social care. It's a tool which is used primarily in project management. And when we talk about stakeholder analysis, we typically refer to a range of techniques or tools that help us identify and understand the needs and expectation of major, uh, you know, players within uh, that particular setup. So in this case, it will be the patients, it would be the staff, it will be the employees uh, and, you know, partners and suppliers, which are pretty much working um, in order to provide integrated model of care uh, through uh, the route, through the means of National Health Service or NHS to the members of public. Now, when we talk about uh, the concept of stakeholder uh, and you know how do we look at communicating to stakeholders you know communication to various stakeholders can be done you know in various different ways and this communication can uh, you know be employer led so in most cases when we look at multidisciplinary teams uh, what we are looking at is that uh, people who are going to be uh, key stakeholders, which are basically key responsibility holders within the organization, need to be communicated, uh, you know, effectively from a point of view of, uh, you know, providing information. So this tends to happen through the use of newsletters, emails, it happens through uh, meetings, it happens through presentations, it happens through, uh, you know, summary reports which are prepared for uh, management team in general. And in some cases, when we see closer collaboration happening, you know, within uh, the within the team uh, on, a, on on certain issues, and obviously looking at, uh, you know, problems, there are, you know, calls, video calls or Zoom calls, as we would say, or meetings which tend to happen, and they would involve different members of the team uh, participating uh, in order to address or, you know, understand the issues uh, in terms of how they can be resolved. So when we talk about, um, you know, uh, communication with different stakeholders, uh, we use various different means to be able to do that. And that would be through the use of emails. Uh, it could be face-to-face -face meetings. It could be video calls. It could be summary reports, presentations. It could be newsletters. And it could also be, you know, from a strategic point of view, sometimes when you look at connecting with different stakeholders, you're also looking at, uh, you know, holding events or seminars, and they would be events or seminars being done in order to bring industry experts together to be able to uh, discuss and, you know, come to conclusions on certain ways forward on policies, procedures, changes which have to be implemented. And that would be done using, uh, you know, various routes of, uh, you know, communication at different levels with stakeholders. So the frequency at which you write, the, the type of communication that you do with the different uh, members uh, or stakeholders, in this case, I would use the word uh, within the team, would depend on the uh, fact that what kind of uh, stakeholder you're writing to. If it's a board, uh, if it's the management, top management of the organization, generally it tends to be formal. And if it's colleagues, peers, then you are looking at informal means of communication, things like uh, you know, online meetings, emails, uh, you know, and 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 face-to-face -face meetings, and they would help you, uh, you know, to engage um, and work with your uh, different team members uh, when working within a multidisciplinary team. So I hope with this, um, you know, bit uh, that we've covered, um, you know, it helps you to bring uh, a good, a good and a better understanding of what are multidisciplinary teams and how do we look at uh, you know, communicating with different members uh, within the multidisciplinary teams, which is uh, essentially stakeholders in MDT. And that brings us to the end of this particular uh, discussion on Learning Outcome 4. Now, at this stage, what I would do is invite questions. If you have any questions or any doubts, I would yeah. be more than happy to, you know, answer those uh, questions.